Gary Franchi here with a very special interview. Peter Schiff joining us now from Euro Pacific Capital, Europac.net. Peter, welcome to the show. Um, you know, the big news right now is that we have hit the debt ceiling. And of course, uh, Mr. Geithner, our Treasury Secretary, has said that he's going to uh, sacrifice uh, government pensions so that they can continue the spending. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, they're basically, they're not really sacrificing anything. They're just using accounting, accounting gimmickry, you know, much the way Enron might have, you know, cooked the books in order to continue to go deeper into debt. So I don't think there's anything being sacrificed. It's a shame because we need to sacrifice government spending. We need to see significant cuts in government spending across the board. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to they're going to ultimately raise the debt ceiling and they're going to borrow well beyond the, what, $14.3 trillion that the current limit is. So where should, where should the cuts begin, would you say, in your opinion? Well, I think they should be across the board. I, I don't think anything should escape cuts. Um, I think some things should be cut more than others, but I certainly think government needs to cut spending across the board, including uh, in the Defense Department, where I think there is a lot of waste, and in uh, entitlements, simply because you know, we just can't afford to dole out this much money in Medicare and Medicaid. Benefits need to be cut, and I think government needs to be smaller, I think a lot of departments need to be eliminated. A lot of government employees need to be let go because the taxpayers can't afford to pay them. Uh, and we need those workers in the private sector uh, producing things, not in the government sector, making it more difficult for the rest of us to produce things. Now, uh, Geithner has repeatedly warned Congress that delaying a vote on raising the debt ceiling could lead to instability in the markets and that failing to vote in favor of the increase would altogether lead to a widespread economic catastrophe. Now, I, I, I argue that we're already there in an economic okay. catastrophe, but uh, you know, he's continuing, continuing to threaten uh, that delaying a vote would create even more instability. What are your thoughts yeah. on that? Look, I mean, there certainly will be some instability, but unfortunately, it's necessary. It's the consequence of all the reckless spending of the past. So we're going to have the instability eventually. Why not have it now when we can deal with it? Why make the problems worse and then have even greater instability later? Because the real threat is not that we uh, fail to raise the debt ceiling, but that we raise it again. So by raising it again, we're, all we're doing is just delaying this inevitable super collapse, which is on the horizon. Absolutely. So let's deal with it now on our own terms before we're dealing with it on our creditors' terms. Because remember, the debt ceiling is a self-imposed limit on borrowing. At some point, we will have a limit imposed by our creditors, by the rest of the world. It won't be that we don't want to borrow. It'll be that nobody wants to lend. And that is a much deeper crisis that we're heading for. And if, in order to avoid dealing with that crisis, the Federal Reserve becomes the lender of only resort, uh, which it's already pretty close to, but if we end up making that mistake, then we wipe out the value of our money, we have runaway inflation, and not only do we wipe out our bondholders, but we destroy the entire U.S. economy because we've wiped out the savings of generations of Americans. I want to talk about inflation and hyperinflation in a moment, but uh, last time Congress allowed the debt ceiling to elapse was in November of 95, which caused Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin to do a lot of fancy fiscal work to keep the government from defaulting. How is that any different than today? I guess it's not any different, only that the deficits are bigger and therefore the problems are bigger. So we're in worse shape and so the consequences of this kind, these kinds of shenanigans are even greater. You know, what we really need to do is deal with the government spending. Let's, let, let's take advantage of the opportunity not to raise the debt ceiling and force fiscal responsibility on Washington today, right now. I mean, I don't buy the argument that somehow going deeper into debt improves our finances. It make, make, makes our economy sounder. It's the exact opposite. It's, it's, it's drawing a hard line today. It's saying the buck stops here. No more deficits. That's what's the first step. That's like you know the alcoholic admitting he has a problem. Until he admits he has a problem, there's no solution. And until we go cold turkey on debt, you know we're not we're not solving anything. Is there any real solution to this? I mean, do we just have to hit the wall before we can uh, before we can pick ourselves back up again? I mean, how do we how can we backpedal out of this collapse? I mean, the the, the dollar is completely losing its value. Prices are going through the roof. We're looking at gold and silver, and and the, and the price of gasoline. Food prices are going up. People are losing their jobs. 
I mean, are we just going to have to deal with this collapse, or are we going? I mean, is there there's, well, is, is there any I, way to get out of this? Well, we haven't seen anything yet. I mean, the dollar declines have been minimal as far as what they're going to do. Uh, prices have only barely begun to rise compared to what ultimately is going to happen. So I think it's going to get a lot worse before our politicians have the courage uh, to do the right thing. Or maybe it's not so much courage. They have no choice because their backs will be to the wall. Right now they have a choice and they choose political expediency. They choose to kick the can down the road. They want to sugarcoat this. They want to try to get to the next election. That's why I'm afraid that they will uh, raise the debt ceiling. So the only reason that you think that maybe we do not see people in the streets uh, like we see in the Middle East is because they're continuing unemployment benefits, uh, they're uh, just prolonging the inevitable? Yeah, it hasn't, it, it hasn't collapsed yet. We haven't got to the point where the Social Security or the unemployment benefits don't buy anything or buy you know, practically nothing. And I think it is going to get to the point where you are going to see riots and protests in the streets. They're coming. But until that happens, it'll be business as usual in Washington. Now I want to talk about the silver and gold prices with direct relationship to inflation. Um, these are economic indicators. Are we, uh, are we, is that road to hyperinflation fast approaching? Well, I, I mean, it's approaching pretty fast. I hope we avoid it. We can avoid it by ultimately doing the right thing. So far, we've done the wrong thing every opportunity we've had. Uh, so doing the right thing would be a major 180 degree change in Washington. But I'm thinking that when our backs are to the wall, that we might ultimately do the right thing after first exhausting all the other possibilities. But that's not a sure thing. We might take this thing all the way uh, to the, the hyperinflationary conclusion. I wouldn't put it past our leaders to do that, which is one of the reasons I'm preparing for it personally and trying to help my, my clients prepare for it. Now let's talk about the gas prices. We're not even in summer season yet, where we traditionally see even higher gas prices. Uh, what are your, um, what's your outlook on that? Well, gas prices are going to move higher until they explode at, to a, in, in, to a, even, at an even more rapid pace. I mean, prices are going up because the money is losing value. Money is losing value because we keep printing it. We keep printing it because that's the only way to keep this phony economy uh, going. So That's what people don't under, people don't understand that people think that quantitative easing was like the Fed put training wheels on the bike and then once the economy is moving uh, on its own uh, they'll remove the training wheels it, the, the the QE isn't the training wheels it's the wheels I mean you remove the wheels and all you got is a frame you're not going to go anywhere without wheels that is the problem you know this economy only can move forward or grow if the Fed sustains it with zero percent interest rates. And uh, but that is doing even greater damage. It's like in order to keep somebody from sobering up, you keep you know force feeding them alcohol. Well, eventually they die of alcohol poisoning. You can't do that forever. Are we going to see another round of quantitative easing from the Fed? Um, yeah, that's I. I mean, I don't, the market I think is accepting the Fed's word that there will be no QE three. I think that's why precious metals are selling off. That's why. Uh, commodities are going down. That's why I think the markets are weak, because you got a lot of weak economic data coming out, and the market assumes that the Fed is going to withdraw the stimulus. I, I don't think there's any way that's going to happen. In fact, the economy is so weak, it, it is on life support. You know, Turning off the stimulus is the equivalent of pulling the plug. I don't think the Fed is going to do that. They've shown no indication in the past that they would do that, even though that is the proper thing to do. Like I said, they've done the wrong thing every chance they've had, and so history says they'll do the wrong thing again, which means QE3. All right, quick question, shifting gears to the uh, 2012 presidential election. Uh, are there any contenders out there that uh, you're focusing your energies on? Well, I mean, so far, you know, a lot of moral support for guys like Ron Paul. I mean, he ran in 2008. Um, you know, I haven't actively, you know, done much yet other than, you know, m you know mention him on my radio show, the Peter Schiff show. I've, I, got, I went down to the debates. Uh, the first presidential debate, so I can uh, w you know s see the debate. So, uh, but I haven't done any real fundraising yet. I haven't done any campaigning uh, for Ron. It's probably something that I will do uh, as this campaign progresses. So, I mean, he's uh, you know my favorite. Uh, I also like uh, Gary Johnson. Uh, he's a good guy. I, I agree with Gary on a lot of things. So, philosophically, uh, those are the two candidates that that, that are closest to me. Um, you know, I'm glad that the field is narrowing a bit. You know, we don't have um, Huckabee, we don't have Trump, 
Uh, we'll see who else we don't have. Uh, but I don't think any of the other candidates, I mean, I guess the biggest name in the race now is Newt Gingrich, and I think he's got a lot of negatives, so I don't, I don't think he's going to win. Uh, so, you know, I think that a lot of people are writing Ron Paul off. They think, oh, he's too much of a long shot. But, you know, given the field and given the mood of the country and what's going on, you know, he's not nearly as much of a long shot as people think. Uh, the word on the street right now is that uh, Romney just raised $10 million in a day. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I forgot about Romney. Yeah, I mean, Romney is, uh, you know, the favorite. I mean, he's, uh, he, he looks the most presidential, right? I mean, if you were going to cast a president in a Hollywood movie, uh, Mitt Romney would be, it would be a good choice. And unfortunately, our elections also often come down to, you know, the sound bites and who looks good on TV and, uh, you know, one-liner. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Romney is going to be formidable. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was also formidable in 2008 and uh you know he got beat by by mccain i mean so i don't know what's different today all right peter schiff thank you for joining us and where can people uh keep up with you well you know i do my my own uh, radio show now every day uh it's called the peter schiff show and you can hear it on shiftradio.com i do it every day from noon uh, from 10 a.m to noon eastern time i mean monday through friday all weekdays they can follow me there. They can also go to my website at Europac.net, E-U-R-O-P-A-C dot net, rather, uh, to read a lot of my commentaries to, uh, you know, if they want to be a brokerage client, I have a precious metals company, EuropacMetals.com, if you're looking for physical uh, precious metals. So there, you know, there are a lot of ways uh, that people can follow my work, and they can buy several of my books. I got How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, which is one of the most recent uh, also, Crash Proof. I'm working on a fourth book right now, but that won't be available for at least a year, year and a half. All right. Well, we'll have you back on when you uh, get your new book out, and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah, well, maybe it'll be before then. But anyway, thanks for having course, me on. Absolutely. We'll see for you again. For 30 years, eFoods Global has been perfecting the process by which we make our food reserves. We start by using only the finest sun-ripened and fresh produce grown and harvested following the good agricultural practices guidelines. Not only are our ingredients GAP certified, but we carefully test them for chemical and microbial contaminants, like salmonella and E. coli, before the approved ingredients are blended into our exclusive recipes following strict quality control standards established and audited by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. These ingredients contain no trans fats, no hydrogenated oils, and no MSG. At eFoods Global, we do not freeze dry our food because the freeze-drying process removes moisture and infuses chemicals into the food to prolong the shelf life. All of our ingredients are dehydrated only using low heat and no chemical preservatives are ever added. Our dehydration process naturally preserves the food so that upwards of 92 percent of the nutritional value remains intact. These quality ingredients are then packaged in moisture-resistant, light-resistant, proprietary assurance packaging that is flushed with carbon dioxide to prevent oxidation and guarantee longer shelf life and quality before sealing the package. Finally, we date stamp the outside of the package the day we prepare the food reserves, so you know you're getting fresh food reserves. eFoods Global Reserves, when properly stored, maintain their flavor and quality for up to 25 years. Now, I know what you're thinking. These can't possibly be the reserves. But these delicious meals are exactly what you get when you prepare your eFoods Global Meals. And none of these meals require more than a pot of boiling water, the contents of a package, and 10 to 20 minutes. Pretty soon, you are going to select some of these delicious meals to try for yourself for free. That's a great opportunity. Let's talk about some other opportunities eFoods Global has to offer you.